understand and to feed on his word together. God, our Father, we thank you that you are the reigning God, the God of power, which you worked in Christ when you raised him from the dead and seated him at your right hand. And so we pray that as we reflect on your power tonight and as we read your life-giving word, we pray that you would enlighten the eyes of our hearts so that we may know with more confidence the hope to which you have called us and bring you much glory as we delight in living for you and making you known. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Acts chapter 18, I'll read from verse 24 down to chapter 19, verse 20. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through to the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him. That is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched the skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leapt on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them, and it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Amen. Uh, Thanks be to God for his word. I want to start tonight, as we often do, with a question. I want to ask you to imagine, what is the least likely place you can conceive of for the gospel to go and flourish? What's the least likely place you can think of where people would hear the gospel and respond to it in repentance and faith. Maybe our minds go to countries which have a majority of non-Christian religions, uh, um, Hindu or Muslim majority countries. I imagine if we heard a report from mission partners there of people hearing the gospel and being so gripped by the good news of Jesus that they left behind the articles of their religion and instead gave themselves to wholehearted devotion to him, we'd be amazed to hear of that. Or maybe we think of somewhere like Brighton, somewhere with a thriving pride movement, 
I imagine if we heard reports from somewhere like that of uh, local people who are heavily involved in the LGBT movement there, hearing of the Lord Jesus, being so moved by him that they leave their jobs working for charities like Stonewall and instead give themselves in wholehearted devotion to the Lord Jesus. We'd be amazed by that. Maybe we think of a YouTube comment section on, on a video of one of the new atheists, the likes of Richard Dawkins. I'm sure that if we saw a, a new video, John Lennox in conversation with Richard Dawkins, but instead of being the usual debate between the two, it was Dawkins sharing his conversion story. How after many years of friendship with Dr. Lennox, he'd come to know the Lord Jesus for himself, was following him personally, had asked his publishers to pulp every copy of The God Delusion and is now available to be booked at a CU Mission Week near you. We'd be amazed by that. Those are all quite out there examples. I think for many of us, though, maybe it's a lot closer to home. Maybe the least likely place we can think of for the gospel to flourish is in the lives of our children in our parents' hearts, in our siblings' hearts and lives. And actually, if we were to go home tonight and get a text or a phone call saying, after many years of living independently and doing my own thing, I've come to know the Lord Jesus, and I want to give myself in wholehearted devotion to him. Well, we'd be amazed, and in every one of those scenarios, I think we'd also be astounded and encouraged and deeply thankful, deeply reassured, and confident in the gospel's power to save and to transform. We think, wow, even in the most unlikely of places, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ can bear fruit. Well, this evening, as Paul said, we're rounding off this little series in the book of Acts for now. We'll pick it up a bit later. And I think if you take just one thing away from this series in Acts, make sure it's this. That everywhere the gospel of the Lord Jesus goes, it bears fruit and the church increases. We've seen that that is true at every stage of the progression in Acts from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And what's remarkable as we round off tonight is that that's true even in Ephesus. Ephesus was renowned in the first century world for two things. We find that there are places in the world that they're renowned for something. Usually if I tell people I'm from St. Andrews, the first question they ask me is, do you play golf? St. Andrews, renowned for golf. Ephesus in the day was renowned for two things, worship of the Greek goddess Artemis on the one hand and on the other for being a center of occult magic practices. There were prevalent things. There were also very profitable things for the local economy. And as Luke draws this section of Acts to the close, the reader should be thinking, if the gospel can make it here, if the gospel can flourish in Ephesus, then it can make it and flourish anywhere. You'll see from the heading above verse 21 in our Bibles, and it's not all plain sailing in Ephesus. What we've just read isn't the complete story of what was all in that city. But it seems that Luke has made a bit of an editorial choice here to end this section in the middle of the Ephesus narrative for a reason. Before we get to the riot story, when we pick up Acts a bit later, we read verse 20. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. So this teaching section of the book, which stretches from chapter 16, verse 6, and ends with the verse I've just read, has shown time and again that when the unstoppable gospel goes to even the most unlikely of places, it flourishes, it bears fruit, and the church grows. And so as this section closes, Luke wants his reader to have confidence that the gospel really, really is unstoppable. Even here in Ephesus, it increases and prevails mightily. And so our aim in studying it together tonight is that we should have confidence. We should have confidence to see how the word of the Lord prevails, even in unlikely places. And to be confident as we go on living it and speaking it for ourselves. You'll see if you have one of these little pieces of paper that will look at it under three headings, three narrative chunks, which combine here to show the reader how the word prevails, even in Ephesus. First of all, through patient correction. And that's what we see firstly in the story of Apollos, who is, verse 24, a native of Alexandria, who's come to Ephesus, an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. 
He'd been instructive in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus that we knew only the baptism of John. Speaking of places that are renowned for something, Alexandria was renowned in the day as being a great center of learning. You might have heard of the great library of Alexandria, which sought to gather all the wisdom of the world into one place. That's where Apollos comes from. And it seems that some knowledge which had come to Alexandria was knowledge of the Christian faith, knowledge of the gospel. Though also it wasn't complete knowledge. I find Apollos a really interesting character. I wonder what you make of it. He doesn't fit neatly into one box. On the one hand, he has a deficient knowledge. He only knows the baptism of John. But on the other, he's different from some other people who we'll meet a little bit later in that he has been instructed about Jesus. He knows the way of the Lord. He, he knows the scriptures well, and he also teaches accurately. So nobody is quite sure exactly how much or how little Apollos knew and didn't know. But it's clear enough that he seems to be here a man of a genuine faith and a genuine desire to make Jesus known, though with also some kind of deficiency in his understanding in spite of his many gifts. Well, that's a setup for his first meeting with Priscilla and Aquila. You might remember our friends that we met last week back in Corinth. You know, the more time I've spent with Priscilla and Aquila over the last couple of weeks preparing these sermons, I've decided that I really love these guys. But they probably, they don't make it to the top of many people's top 10 Bible characters lists. But here we see them coming across a really gifted, really eloquent, really intelligent teacher who hasn't quite got it right. What do we do if we're in their position? How would Apollos go down in our modern age? I can already see people sharing blog posts about Apollos has got it wrong, here's five reasons why. Or the YouTube comment section on his sermons would be awash with theological debate. Maybe some would even try to get him cancelled. But that's not Priscilla and Aquila's approach as we read in verse 26. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. This is why I love Priscilla and Aquila. Rather than publicly shaming Apollos, standing up in one of his meetings and shouting, you know, we're actually friends with Paul, and uh, you go to listen to us instead of him. He doesn't know what he's talking about, we do. No, they, they recognize his gifts, they recognize his eloquence, his learning, and so they take him aside and say, Apollos, we love what you're doing here, but there's a bit more you haven't understood. Let me explain. And so they fill in the gaps in his knowledge so that he becomes an even more effective evangelist and pastor and teacher. That's what we see him going on to next. He uses his gifts not only to help and encourage believers, but also to contend for the gospel among the Jews, whose scriptures he knows intimately well. So I'm sure there are probably some lessons for us here in humility. In this slightly tribal, confrontational age we live in, it can be easy to see anyone with whom we disagree, anyone who says something even slightly different, from the party line that we're used to as an enemy rather than a brother or sister in need of patient correction. And those of us who are involved in Bible teaching, it's easy for us to write off any criticism we receive from people because they just don't get it. They don't know as much as me. It's actually quite lovely, quite humble that Apollos, the learned, eloquent scholar, receives correction from a couple of tent makers from Corinth. Isn't that great? So there are some lessons here for us in humility and in how we deal with confrontation and difference. But I take it, though, the main point here isn't just the need to be humble or the need to give and receive loving correction, important though those things are. No, Luke's point throughout this whole section is to grow our confidence in the unstoppable word of the Lord. So here in the story of Apollos, that word is at work to grow and to strengthen the witness of the church in Ephesus and beyond. 
but presumably the gaps in Apollos' knowledge that Aquila and Priscilla fill in come from the word. And we see so clearly that it's not for nothing that it's from the scriptures that Apollos is able to reason and contend for the truth. We're seeing here that the word which is cherished and taught by Corinthian tent makers and by a leading scholar is the word which grows the church, which unites it in mission and which brings people to know the Lord Jesus. So here's another reminder for us from this story. It's of how central the word of the Lord is to our church life, how it has power to draw together people from vastly different backgrounds, how its right teaching feeds and grows so that the people from those different backgrounds are sent out united together and sharing it with the outside world, confident in its ability through God's sovereignty to bring people to know Jesus. That's also the case when Paul meets some disciples at the start of chapter 19. Well, you might have noticed some similarities between Paul's encounter and what we've just read about Apollos, but there's one key difference. While it's likely that Apollos was already a believer, the men Paul meets here clearly weren't. We know that because they haven't yet received the Holy Spirit. So these verses have got a lot of people quite animated and confused over the years. They have been traditionally misunderstood by some to suggest a kind of two-stage Christian experience, whereby you can become a follower of Jesus one day, and then on another day, even years later, you can receive the Holy Spirit and enter into a slightly higher plane of Christian existence. But it's reasonably clear here that receiving the Holy Spirit for Paul is the marker of genuine conversion. The thing which happens at the moment of conversion, not an aspiration for the future of some Christians. So it seems likely that this group of disciples had been following to some extent the teaching of John the Baptist. They knew that a Messiah had been promised maybe, and that they should repent, but not much else. When they say we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit, it's likely they probably mean that they they know of the Holy Spirit's existence. They would know that from the Old Testament scriptures, but they're ignorant of his life and ministry in the world at the minute. They're ignorant of Pentecost and not aware of his active agency within the life of all believers. And so not unlike Aquila and Priscilla, Paul fills in this central gap in their knowledge after which they are baptized and then exhibit the markers of the Holy Spirit's work, which we've already seen in Acts. Once again, that's showing us how God here is at work to bring his unstoppable word to bear fruit in even this unlikely place. Before the start of chapter 19, the Christian scene in Ephesus consists of Apollos, who's actually now gone away on his own mission journey, a few interested Jews who met at the end of last week, and Paul. Now, there's a fledgling church of Paul plus 12 local converts equipped for service. And yet again, it's the word which is essential to all of this. The same unstoppable word which prevails, unites God's people in witness. And as we've seen time and time again, it's the teaching of that word which lies right at the heart of Paul's ministry. And we see it again here in our second point, persuasion and reasoning. There really isn't much new to say here that we haven't already seen before, not least last week. By now, if we've been following this series in Acts, it can't be any surprise to us to see that in spite of being in Ephesus, an unlikely place for the gospel to flourish, Paul's approach really doesn't change at all. Chapter 19, verse 8, he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them. Paul, as is his wont, goes to the synagogue, spends three months making a reasoned, persuasive presentation of the gospel, persuading people to accept Jesus as Lord for themselves. And the language that's used here implies that he was seeing fruit from this too. People were not only hearing, but receiving that gospel, knowing Jesus personally, becoming converted in the synagogue. But eventually there reaches a point after a few months where he sees there's no more fruitful work to be done among the Jews. And so he withdraws 
But once again, just like last week, he doesn't go too far away. Verse 9, he withdrew from them, took his disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Again, I think there's a lot we can learn from Paul's example, from his methodology. When he's hitting brick walls with one group of people, he tries to establish a work elsewhere. It's thought that the lecture hall of Tyrannus would have been in use in the cool of the morning and in the late afternoon. So Paul would probably have a hire of it during the worst part of the day, the hottest part of the day when it was stifling. And yet he was able to teach there through the hottest hours of the day in a less than ideal setting and see his persistent, persuasive reasoning bear fruit to such an extent that all the residents of Asia heard the word. So yes, again, there are things we can take from that example. The need to keep going in our evangelism. The need to not be discouraged by the rejection that we face, but to go on speaking all those things that we saw last week. Once again, the main point is not just a lesson on evangelistic method. We see here another confidence building picture of just how unstoppable the gospel is. A throwaway line like, all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, might wash over us. But actually, it's pretty huge. That progression that we've talked much about from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the earth, by this point, at the end of this section in Acts, is well underway. The unstoppable gospel has gone out. It's been opposed by the Jewish authorities. It's been questioned and reviled by the Roman Empire, the most powerful force on earth, met with revulsion and violence in pagan territory. And yet, and yet, and yet, it continues to spread and to bear fruit, to increase and reveal everywhere it goes. That. That is the big thing we should take from this passage. And as we leave off Acts for now, the big thing we should take from the book. It's so easy for us to lose sight of that and to think that the gospel is very stoppable. Maybe as we approach the summer, as we reach the end of an academic year and face a few quieter months, we can feel a bit weary, a bit discouraged by how one year on, maybe some of those friends and family members, we were so full of hope and prayer for in September, would seem any closer to the gospel now than they were nine, ten months ago. I haven't seen much progress in the lives of our friends and families in terms of their response to hearing of Jesus. But the thing that keeps us going in our speaking of Jesus to anyone who will hear is knowing that in God's sovereignty, he can use the gospel. He does use the gospel to bear fruit everywhere it goes. Not only has he ordained favorable conditions for it to flourish in Ephesus, the ministry of Apollos, the correction of 12 disciples, he has used its ongoing sharing to build his kingdom. And that's all the more remarkable as we come to consider the specific situation in Ephesus itself and how the gospel comes up against it. Our third, our final P tonight, par. I think that verse 11 really helpfully sets the scene for what we read in verses 12 to 20. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. That's helpful because right away it clears up a couple of things for us. Like why these supernatural displays of power happen in Ephesus, but they don't happen everywhere Paul goes. And why throughout the last couple of weeks we've seen that clear Simple proclamation of the gospel is what Luke wants his readers to take confidence in, even though here it's backed up by healings and exorcisms. Luke tells us what's happening in Ephesus is extraordinary. It's not the norm. You might remember last week in Corinth, we saw God giving assurance to Paul in the form of a vision, telling him to go on speaking and to not be silent. Well, here, divine confirmation of his ministry and of the gospel's power takes the form of these miraculous healings and exorcisms connected to even the clothes that Paul wore. And it makes perfect sense because in a place where occult practices, magic, pagan worship were so prevalent, 
Indeed, in a place where those things looked so powerful, or they struck so much fear and curiosity into the hearts and lives of your average Ephesian citizen. Well, it makes perfect sense that the divine authority of the gospel in a place like that is confirmed by signs and wonders, which show that there is one true God who reigns in power. In our first reading earlier, we saw Paul praying for the Ephesian church that they would understand what is the immeasurable greatness of his power, God's power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. Paul prays that for the Ephesian church in his pastoral letter to them. Because they are in a place where it must look like power and rule and dominion look like they come from other places. Whether that's the Caesars, the goddess Artemis, or magic. So he's wanting to reassure the Ephesian church a bit later that the Lord Jesus really is on the throne. That real power is really found in him. And he really is seated far above all those things. And similarly, as the gospel is going out in Ephesus, it is going out with demonstrations of divine power, which show a culture which is used to seeing demonic displays of power. And actually, Jesus Christ really is Lord, seated above all things at the right hand of God. It's a sign of just how prevalent these kinds of things were in Ephesus, that even some of the local Jewish leaders were in on the act. These itinerant exorcists that we read about. That's why they start trying to use Jesus' name to boost their treat. Verse 13, some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. We've seen before the apostles in Acts, particularly early in Acts, invoking the power of Jesus' name to perform miraculous healings and wonders. But Jesus' name, of course, is no magic word. It can't be invoked as a kind of mechanical process to achieve what you want it to. That's what the sons of Sceva get wrong. Jesus' name isn't something they can just throw around second hand. Even the very fact that it's the Jesus whom Paul proclaims shows that these guys don't really know Jesus at all. His name won't be thrown around like that. In that sense, even the demon they encounter in this passage, he's actually one up on them because he does know Jesus. Jesus I know, Paul I recognize, but who are you? And so the sons of Sceva get their comeuppance. Fleeing naked would have been particularly shameful for the sons of a respectable Jewish family whose father is a priest. And this strange episode has a really clear effect and purpose. This became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. In superstitious, pagan Ephesus, where fear of demons was real and was really driving people to the occult. Well, fear of the one whose name can provoke such a response from a demon comes to supersede the superstitious fear that the Ephesians have been used to. The unstoppable gospel of the Lord Jesus goes up against a town full of deadly superstition. And it prevails. That leads us back to where we began this evening. Delivery from demons takes a couple of forms in Acts 19. The really dramatic healings and exorcisms associated with Paul's ministry and with his garments. And also, as we read here, in the conversion of many. Verse 18, many of those who are now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. They counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. 
See the complete transformation we've just seen in Ephesus, where the name of Jesus is now held in such high esteem. So many people have come to put their trust in Jesus' name, that it has totally transformed their lives, their behaviors, their priorities. I mentioned at the start that magic was big business in Ephesus. So they could have sold these books and magic articles and wands and made a pretty big payday. Actually, their lives are now so entirely rooted in Jesus as Lord. They want absolutely nothing to do with anything that's contrary to him. Nothing to do with their old way of life. After all, they don't need magic anymore because they know that Jesus is Lord of all with power over sin and death and Satan and the demons who they are so afraid of. They also don't need the money that selling these books would get them. Because Jesus himself is now their greatest treasure. Now remember, Ephesus doesn't end there. And when we pick up these studies in the book of Acts, at some point in the future, we'll pick up with a riot, which might feel like more familiar ground for those of us who've been following Paul's journey along the way. And yet before we get there, we see in this verse 20, Paul's usual marker at the end of a section, some comment on how the word increases and prevails and bears fruit and grows. Yes, the story goes on, but this particular chapter of Acts is being brought to a close. And it's being brought to a close on a note of confident assurance. The unstoppable gospel prevails, just as we've seen it do in countless places between Jerusalem and Ephesus. It increases and prevails mightily, even in the most unlikely places. It's the word of the Lord, which is able to call sinners to repentance. It's the gospel of the Lord Jesus, which is able to transfer lost people from the domain of darkness and Satan and into the kingdom of God's beloved son. It's the word of the Lord, which is used to transform the dark hearts of those walking away from God to the light of those walking with him. And so as we close this evening, And as we close this section in our studies and acts, I know the idea of rejection and opposition might feel a bit more familiar to us than the idea of the word of the Lord increasing and prevailing mightily and bearing much fruit. But friends, that shouldn't put us off going on speaking of Jesus. We are not guaranteed success, far from it. But we can have every confidence that if the gospel can transform hearts in Ephesus, it can do the same anywhere it goes. It can do the same today. If it can draw sorcerers to burn their magic books, it can pierce right through any obstacle that might be thrown at it in our world. Whether that's literal worship of false gods or subscription to whatever particular ideology is hot at the moment, or an idolatrous misplaced trust in money or success or family or romantic love, or even in the very plight, contented rejection that we might experience from many of our dearest friends and family. The gospel can pierce into any of these things and increase and prevail mightily. I'm sure that many of us in this room will have walked in some of those things and can ourselves testify to the gospel's power to transform and change and heal. And many more of us will encounter them in our friends and family and work networks and feel as if people that we know and love are a lost cause. But if the gospel can make it in Ephesus, it can make it anywhere. God really is the God we've been reflecting on and singing to and praying to tonight, the God of sovereign power. He really can bear fruit through the teaching of his word anywhere it goes. And so we go on speaking with confidence and looking to and trusting in him. Will you pray with me as we close? 
Our Father, we thank you that your word really does prevail. We thank you that because you are sovereign, because you rule in power, you can use the teaching of your word to transform dark hearts everywhere it's taught. And so we pray that you would give us great confidence in your word. We pray that you would, in your kindness, allow it to remain the center of our church life. Use it to grow us in our love for you and for one another. Use it to grow us in our confidence of who you are. Father, we long and pray that you would use us to teach it to many who will hear. That you would grow your kingdom among us in St. Andrews and everywhere we teach of your word. It's in Jesus' name and for your glory we pray. Amen. Well.